today's topic. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Nelson. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be here. I'm very happy to be here. I've met a lot of interesting people today. I thought I'd say something personal first that even Tom doesn't know about me. The very first time I ever gave a talk outside of my home institution, when I had no name whatsoever, who asked me to give a talk outside? It was Brown University. Okay. I'm always going to be grateful to Antal Yavitsky and uh, that crowd who invited me. You never forget the people who were nice to you the first time, so thank you. Okay. I thought we should start before we really get going with a direct and unfiltered experience of nature. Okay, it's supposed to be a public talk. And uh, well, you know, the first thing you gotta do if you wanna direct an unfiltered experience of nature is turn off the computer. Right? We spend so much of our life awash in virtual this and virtual that. Let's turn off the computer and the lights, please, and, and look at some stuff. Okay, so uh, could we turn on the, the first thing? Okay, so what do you see in there? There's this, there's no digital anything, right? There's this white hot piece of metal which is giving off light. It's going through a piece of red plastic, landing on the screen, comes back to your eyes, you get a visual perception, which I think we'll all agree is red. Oh, one moment. Gentlemen, sorry, 4% of you won't see the same thing that all the rest of us are seeing. I apologize, I'll make it up to you later. But uh, most of us are seeing red there, okay. Uh, I didn't tell you it was going to be an interesting experience of nature. I just said it was going to be unfiltered. So let's turn that off and get another one. Okay, there's another one. Okay, very familiar. We, we all were taught, you know, hit over the head until we said the word green when we saw that. Let's get them both up there. But now, you know, without changing the slides, Something kind of peculiar happens, okay? Your reptile brain is looking at that and saying in the middle of that screen, I've got some equally pure and unitary experience called yellow, which is not reddish green and not greenish red. It's something new, says your reptile brain, even though your intellect just saw me make it by combining the red and the green. So something doesn't fit. Something's kind of weird there. Um, let's turn those both off for a minute and... Uh, get the other one. Uh, so here's yet another experience that we call white, and people think of white as being the absence of any kind of color. But you know, if we go back to the uh, 17th century, oh, can you see it over there? Uh, people were starting to realize that you could take this chunk of glass and stick it in that beam of light, and out come these beautiful, vivid, saturated colors, and where did they come from? So you know, there was a theory that was very popular. Oh, and by the way, you know, I'm staying in the Hope House, and uh, there's a decoration in the Hope House that I filched temporarily. I have to remember to bring it back, but you know, it works too. So there's nothing special about this piece of glass from Pennsylvania. Here's a piece of glass from Rhode Island and it works okay. So, so, so you know, debate was swirling. Where do those colors come from? And there was a popular theory. People were saying, oh yes, the light, the, the, this piece of glass is adding the colors. It stains the light. Well, this is pure. Something is adding the colors. And so Isaac Newton comes on the stage and he, says, he can't really believe that. Could you get the white off, please, and the red back? He says, well, yeah, if that were the case, then I could uh, take that prism and send the red light through it and get colors. And this same piece of glass is powerless to create any colors. If I send it, okay, there's just a little bit of uh, yellow there, but uh, it's not making that rainbow when I send it into monochromatic light. Let's be sure with the green, too. Uh-uh, uh-uh, no spectrum of the green. Uh, there again, you can see just a little bit of spread, but uh, that's because it wasn't a perfectly monochrome. Let's put the red and the green together. Oh, I can separate them out very easily. Okay, it's not like there was some chemical reaction between the red light and the green light that makes yellow light. They're still completely separate things. Even a little chunk of glass can separate them out. So here comes the problem. When I send you the white light, send that to the prism, I get the spectrum. In the middle of the spectrum, there's a yellow, 
That yellow cannot be split any further by any prism, but this yellow can, even though it looks exactly the same to your eyes. We've all been told that either evolution or some creator has made us the pinnacle of all creation, and uh, you know, how can our eyes be so crappy that they can't tell the difference between one kind of yellow and another kind of yellow that looks exactly the same? Let's get the, uh, let's get the blue up there, because there's something else going on. Uh, if I swing the blue in there, uh, then okay, there's some magenta on the top, there's some yellow over there, there's a little cyan down at the bottom, and there's something kind of white in the middle. There too, that's not the spectrum of sunlight, that's not what's coming out of that projector without the slides. I can separate that white back into, you know, where'd the blue go? Oh, it's there. Oh, there it is, there it is. Okay, I can separate that out as well. So there again, there's two kinds of yellow, but there's two kinds of white, there's lots of different kinds of white. And our eyes can't tell them even though, tell them apart even though we're supposedly so great. So, okay. We got some stuff to deal with. I, I think I'm ready for, uh, I think I'm done with those. So uh, now we can get started. And uh, yeah, good, okay. Uh, so when I send light from the sun or from that white projector through the prism, I get that nice continuous spectrum. If I take lights from compact fluorescent bulbs, the kind that we spend most of our days sitting underneath, I get this totally different spectrum. It's got some green, some red, and some blue, but uh, those dark gaps in between them, and it looks the same. It still looks white. So how can two different kinds of light look the same? Something doesn't fit. OK, so today, maybe I should start the talk. Uh, I just have two things on my mind today. Uh, what is color anyway, and how do we see it? OK, and if we make any progress on that question, then uh, perhaps we could make a gadget that discriminates color better than humans. Could, could be useful for something. Okay, and then I wanna say, in a related vein, what sets the ultimate limit on our visual sensitivity? And are we anywhere close to that ultimate limit? And if we make any progress on that, same thing. Might be able to make a gadget that leverages that insight into something useful. That'd be fun, that'd be good. So we started already with the direct experience. We're gonna talk about color, we're gonna talk about light quanta. There'll be just three slides for the experts, unless I run out of time, in which case, sorry experts. And uh, then we're gonna wrap up. So that's, oh yeah, and uh, that little thing up there, you know, when the green bar gets as long as the gray bar, then you can all go home. Okay, so. <laughs> I'm just gonna to bring to bear some big ideas, not too many. Understanding your own body sometimes requires top level physics ideas. Uh, throughout history, a lot of physics ideas uh, were in, first uncovered in the process of people trying to understand how some living organism did something. I think that's inspiring. Sometimes a physical measurement can give you insight decades earlier than should have been possible. I think the more times we can say that to our students, the better, because of course our students need to understand things sooner than their competitors. But sometimes that measurement needs to be coupled with some mathematical analysis. So, ooh, ooh, there's the math word, but I'm not gonna bore you too much with that today, but I wanna show you how that works in some examples. But once you understand even a little bit about how nature has implemented some of these impressive tricks, then there are often practical benefits that come out. Now, what about truth and beauty? Yeah, okay, it's also beautiful, but that's not what you know, pays the bills, okay? <laughs> that's what makes us work hard, because we love truth and beauty, but, uh, those practical benefits are, you know, why we're here. Now, different people have different metaphors for what science is all about. It's like climbing a mountain. It's like solving a murder mystery, whatever. Let me give you another metaphor for what I think science is all about. I think of it in terms of espionage, okay? You know, we have this network of agents. We have this complex, distant adversary like cancer or climate change or something like that. And some of the agents are assigned to you know, infiltrate that factory, something that's obviously practically important, and that's called applied research. Okay. Other agents are just looking at the world, trying to find things that don't fit, and that's called pure research. Okay. And uh, that's what we're trying to do, and uh, you never know which of those things that don't fit is gonna turn into something. Like real espionage, it's often boring. It's often lonely. 
You often have no idea whether it's going to pay off in the long run and actually help anybody out, but sometimes some master spy can put things together that didn't seem to have any connection, and then you get something good. So that's what we're trying to accomplish with all this scientific business, and uh, I'll come back to that from time to time. Um, but, oh yes, we're supposed to be talking about color. Well, color is fascinating, right? You sit down on an airplane with somebody and they say, what do you do? And you say, I'm a physicist. The, what are they going to say? They're going to say, I hated physics. I failed physics. And then you have the rest of the flight all to yourself. <laughs> okay? If you say, I study color vision, you're going to be talking to them for the whole time. <laughs> oh, my Aunt Harriet has blah, blah, blah. Okay, so people are fascinated with color vision. And co but color vision is extremely useful. It's extremely useful to humans and other animals. Uh, you look around at the world, the world is full of objects. You need to segment your visual perception into objects. And you know, color is a big cue that helps you segment your visual stimuli into, into objects that form a scene in your head. Okay? Uh, it's important for recognizing an object. And at some point in our evolutionary history, you know, our ancestors found it was very important to be able to tell whether fruit was ripe or not without having to go over there and take a bite out of it. And uh, that's when we developed three color vision, which dogs don't have. OK, so they say. Uh, it's important to know whether that individual over there is in your species or some other species and would make a good mate or would not make a good mate. OK, animals use that all the time. Uh, whether that individual over there is in an aggressive state or not in a friendly state, you know, some animals use color for that. So OK, it's simple. It's beautiful, but it's not quite simple, is it? And we found that little funny paradox that we need to understand. We made that uncomfortable observation that our eyes discard a lot of information that's potentially present in the visual world. Our eyes are throwing some of that away. That's why we can't tell the difference between that impure yellow and the pure yellow that is part of the spectrum. We'd like to know, you know what's going on there. But every puzzle is an opportunity. There's the intellectual opportunity. If something doesn't fit, maybe we'll learn something useful about it. And if we learn something useful about it, who knows, maybe we could cook up a gadget that does not discard as much information about the visual world. Might be good for something. So that's where we're going right now. I don't need this. OK. Uh, we should find out some way of thinking about these ideas quantitatively. You know, I can show you white, or I can send it through the prism and make that spectrum, or I can draw a little graph. I can, on this axis of the graph, I can have where you are in the spectrum. And on that axis, I can have how much light is present. And then this white light translates into a graph that's got an, a flat top on it. Whereas this magenta colored light, you send that through a prism and you get a gap in the middle. There's a lot of blue, a lot of red, not much green. And that turns into a graph with a dip in the middle. So this idea of uh, representing all the different kinds of colors, this, this magenta, by the way, it's not anywhere in the spectrum. There's, Magenta does not appear in the spectrum. Okay? It is a particular kind of mixture of light that gives you a particular kind of uh, impression that most of us say magenta when we see it. So that's how we're going to be thinking about this idea about mixing. A patch of color is some particular spectrum of light, some particular relative amount of various things. Okay, now let me, uh, let me introduce our hero. Okay, our hero is Thomas Young. And uh, he's a hero for lots of reasons, but uh, he has this chain of hypotheses, which I still, it just blows me away how modern this was to say these things in 1802. He says, well, you know, Isaac Newton has already told us that light comes in different flavors, and so-called white light can be separated. And let's call those flavors position in the spectrum. Okay, that's something we know about light now. Even when you mix them, they retain their distinct character. You can unmix them. So it's not like there's some chemical reaction between the different kinds of light. This thing that we call color involves the relative amounts of those different flavors of light. OK, we've seen that already. I guess our eyes must contain a mosaic of pixels. Now it's starting to get pretty modern. He didn't use the word pixels, of course, but uh, that's what we call them today. There must be a mosaic of pixels. And here's the, here's the mind-blowing part. All the brain can possibly know is what's coming in from those pixels. And think about it, it's 1802, right? No antibiotics, no flush toilets. You know, that's an amazingly modern thing. All the, the brain can't see or hear or taste anything. All the brain knows is what's coming down the wires from those receptors. And, says Thomas Young, I believe there are each one of those 
pixels, each one of those, which we now call photoreceptor cells, is only sensitive to a particular range of spectral positions. The cells are individually tuned. That's his key insight. Of course, there was no, no electron microscope, so no electron microscope pictures. There are the photoreceptor cells, a picture that Thomas Young, of course, never was able to see. So let's see. What is this tuning business? What do I mean tune? Isn't that a, isn't that a phrase from acoustics? Oh, right. But we have to talk about acoustics because it's the A.O. Williams lecture. So there you go, A.O. Williams. Uh, I said something about acoustics, but no, it's relevant. Light has this spectrum. Sound has a spectrum. Light does things that are reminiscent of things that sound do, does. And in particular, you know, have an organ pipe. It sings a particular note, and what note does it sing depends on its physical dimensions. You know, the long ones have low notes, and the short ones have high notes, and light does stuff like that too. Uh, here is a series of test tubes, and each one's got a suspension of little crystals in it, and chemically, they're all exactly the same stuff. They're all cadmium selenide crystals in, suspended in water. Why are they all fluorescing at different colors? Well, these ones are bigger crystals, and those ones are smaller crystals. The physical dimensions of this object relate to the wavelength, uh, relate to the color of the light that comes off as if it was a wavelength. So uh, each one of these is tuned to a different frequency. Maybe there's something in those photoreceptor cells which is similarly tuned. Similarly, a guitar string will only, and this is giving off light, but a guitar string only absorbs light at frequencies with the right, fre at, at the right frequencies. And uh, maybe there's something in those things that uh, maybe spectral position is a kind of frequency. Maybe the receptor cells in our eyes contain something that's selective because of some kind of resonance, like acoustic resonance. Let's suppose the receptor's response to the spectral position is what you get when you multiply the intensity of light at that part of the spectrum times the sensitivity of whatever is in there to that particular color, which is a linear relationship. Okay, that's what that's unpacking there, and all of these concepts were available to Thomas Young. That's what he had in mind. Okay, he had in mind little vibrating strings, which is not what we have in mind anymore, but still, that's the idea. So let's continue that chain of reasoning. That's what I said before. Now we say each photoreceptor has its own distinct sensitivity range, and they only come in just three classes. Each cell has the same sensitivity range as all the others in its class, and there's only three classes proposes Thomas Young. Now, how does that help? What does that do for us? Well, here I've imagined two of them, and I've drawn another one of those spectra-like things. Here on this axis, we have what color am I talking about, where I am in the spectrum. On this one, instead of the intensity of light, I've got how sensitive is that cell. So I've got one cell whose sensitivity peaks around green. I'm going to call those the green receptors, and one that peaks somewhere around orange, which I'll call the red receptors with a huge overlap between them. This is a proposal. It took a long time for people to confirm that quantitatively, but let's just follow that idea. Every region of my visual field has some of these green receptors and some of those red receptors with separate wires into the brain. What happens if I present yellow light to that visual field? Well, that's where those two curves intersect. So if I present pure spectral yellow light, then the green receptors and the red receptors are going to be stimulated equally because they're equally sensitive to wavelengths, and they're going to be sending equal signals to the brain. On the other hand, if I send in a mixture of some green light and some red light, then I can get the same result. The green light is going to stimulate the green receptors more and the red receptors less. The red light is going to do the vice versa, and when you add those contributions, you're going to still have the property that the green receptors and the red receptors are giving equally strong signals to the brain, even though you didn't send in any yellow light. That's the idea. And all the brain can know about color is what's coming off those receptors. If they're making the same signals, then you get the same perception no matter what was physically entering your eye. So that's Thomas Young's proposal for how we could get confused about green plus red looking like yellow. The brain can't tell the difference because all it knows is what the cells are telling it, proposes Thomas Young. OK, let me just take a step back a minute. Pure spectral light has this continuously varying property called, I'm calling it spectral position. Many pictures are possible. There's an enormous, infinite variety of spectra available. But our eyes are only sampling those spectra with three sensitivity curves. 
And all you're getting is the integral over the whole sensitivity curve of what's coming in. That's just three numbers. From that whole infinite dimensional space of spectra, only three numbers are coming to the brain. No wonder you're discarding a great deal of information. All the brain can know is those three signals. That leads to this ambiguity of color discrimination. Okay, so Young was way ahead of his time. No one had seen a photoreceptor cell. There were no microscopes. Even when the electron microscope was invented, they look exactly the same. Even in the electron microscope, they look exactly the same. There's no way to tell that there's three of them until people were able to record individually from those cells, make electrical recordings individually from those cells. Then they found that there were three categories of spectral responses, and I'll get to that. So, all right, it took 162 years for people to conclude that Thomas Young was right by direct measurements. I call that spycraft, okay? Are we done? We saw something weird, we found a hypothesis, seemed to explain it, time to call the venture capitalists. Well, wait, not quite. You can take a lot of flack if you're 162 years ahead of your time, okay? Peer review wasn't built to handle that sort of situation. So here's a review that Thomas Young got. Difficult to deal with an author whose mind is filled with a medium of such fickle vibratory nature. Search without success for traces of learning, acuteness, blah, blah. A savage review, okay? So what are you going to do when you're faced with that? Well, Thomas Young quit science, okay? He, rent and he translated the Rosetta Stone, right? Other people had to pick up the story. If it's you, you might not want to quit science. You have to nail your case. You have to make it stick somehow or admit that you're wrong. So this brings us to another story. This is supposed to be a public lecture. And you know, well, I read a lot of popularizations, and very often, they start out with, you know, here's Albert Einstein. He's sitting in his chair. He's feeling it pushing against his butt. He's a transcendent genius. He has this great idea. And today we have GPS. <laughs> and I feel that there's something missing in between the beginning and the ending of that story. And it's important, right? Because if you're a young person and you read too many of those stories, you say, oh, yeah, great. I'm not a transcendent genius. I don't get to play this game. This has nothing to do with me. If you're an old person, I mean someone who pays taxes, <laughs> you may say, yeah, well, so then why do we fund science? You know, there's always going to be two or three transcendent geniuses on the planet, and funding won't make any more of them. And he had a day job at the time anyway. And uh, GPS was invented, was, was you know, developed by uh, industry. So what's the point of funding science? So that's where the missing step comes in. The missing step is called scientific research. And, uh, there are a million ideas that are fantastically cool and brilliant and which nature has not chosen to use. And you have to get rid of those ones. And uh, that costs money. And you have to do some things. And to the first, to the young person, I would say, uh, the great bulk of scientific research does not involve being a transcendent genius. It's sort of carpentry. Okay? Any medium clever person like me can do that if you're meticulous and have good taste. And to the old person who pays taxes, I would say, uh, yeah, yeah, industry does, has stopped doing fundamental research in this country. And uh, that's why it's important to uh, get that missing step so that you get winnowed down all those beautiful but ideas that nature didn't choose to use down to the ones that uh, nature did choose to use, which might perhaps pay off. Oh, yeah, and anyway. The propositions we most desperately wish to be true are the ones we should mistrust the most and put to the most severe test. OK, so what do I mean by test? How can we, uh, how can we liberate Thomas Young from uh, that calumny? Well, here's a kind of experiment that uh, people did, starting with James Clerk Maxwell. Link James Clerk Maxwell did this experiment brought this to a, a great pitch. He wasn't the first, but he, and uh, then people came after him and even more. Here I've got uh, an organism, okay? And uh, this organism uh, is viewing a split screen. One kind of light is being projected on the left-hand side of that screen, and three kinds of light are being projected on the right-hand side of that screen, and there's three knobs, and the organism is instructed, is trained, to turn those knobs until you can't tell the difference between those two sides of the screen. It's the color matching experiment. Can it even be done? Well, we saw some examples where it could be done. 
you saw, right, in this demo. And uh, this sort of systematizes that. You go through a great, great variety of target lights. Every time you t diddle the two, three knobs, you discover, can I or can I not find a match? And when you do find a match, uh, the experimenter writes down what the numbers were on the three knobs and uh, makes a data set. So you get a data set like this. Here, uh, the target lights were all pure monochromatic lights from uh, blue up to red. And uh, here on this axis, you get where were the knob settings. So you send in red light, and uh, the subject turns up the red and turns down the green and the blue. And you send in blue light, and the subject turns up the blue and turns down the green and the red. And in between, you get something else. So that's quite a lot of quantitative data that your theory will either succeed or fail at explaining. Theory makes testable predictions, because now it's possible to uh, record the sensitivity curve of each one of those photoreceptor molecules. Uh, here, are the here are the sensitivity curves. If you know the sensitivity curve, and you know the spectrum of the light that's coming in, you do that linear relationship, and you find out what are the three numbers being sent to the brain. Of course, those three numbers depend on how bright the red, green, and the blue were. So on the right-hand side, you put the target light in. You multiply it by these spectra. You do the integral. You get three numbers. On the other side, you put in the red, the green, and the blue. You multiply them by what the settings were on the knobs and set that in. And uh, you predict with no free fit parameters whatsoever what those three knob settings should be in order to make the colors match. And you hope that it works out. And uh, well, the, uh, the curves there are the theoretical prediction, and the dots are the experimental data. And it worked out, and it worked out pretty well for a zero free fit parameters prediction. So that's vindicating Thomas Young with a very detailed quantitative prediction that could have failed. And how do we get the quantitative prediction? We had to solve three linear equations in three unknowns. OK, some high school math. OK, so that's, that, that's some problem set in an undergraduate class. So yeah, it's looking promising. OK, uh, what's the technological payoff? Well, you know, your computer screen, it says it has millions of colors, but uh, it shouldn't be necessary to have every little region of your screen have millions of different pixel types. Every region of your screen has three pixel types. And you get all those million colors just by adjusting the intensity of the three kinds. Okay, here's what your screen, or this is the Sony Trinitron TV looks like under a microscope. So just three phosphors in your computer screen are enough to uh, simulate all the millions of colors. That's nice. That's good for technology. But of course, uh, that one's kind of old news, right? That goes back to the era of color television. Uh, I promised you something about superhuman vision, not human vision. So, uh, and anyway, that was a 19th century phenomenon. So let's think. Most mammals have less color discrimination than we do. It turns out that most mammals have only two categories of cone cells, photoreceptor cells, whereas uh, we humans have three. So that puts us above most mammals, us apes, us, uh, us old world apes uh, above most mammals. That's good. Uh, but uh, I don't want you to get too complacent there because you know chickens have better color discrimination than most birds have four color vision. Sorry to say that, okay. So what we really want is not superhuman vision, but super chicken vision. And, uh, oh, but not that super chicken, some other super chicken. Okay, so, but seriously, you know, you get pregnant. After a certain age, people are going to encourage you to do genetic te testing. And uh, the old school way of genetic testing is you, know, you, you get some cells, and you wait for them to go into division. And you look at the chromosomes. You stain them and cut them out with a pair of, pinking, uh, 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 of, of nail clippers and uh, line them up next to each other and look at the pairs and see if there's any obvious gross defects. Right? It's called karyotyping. Okay? And you know there's. 22 pairs, but I'm just showing two pairs there. And those ones look OK, right? There's a big one, there's a little one. They look about the same. Trouble is, you know, when you take them all, wouldn't it be nicer if you could stain each one all up and down its length with one characteristic color so you could look for giant transpositions and things missing? Trouble is, there, there aren't that many different fluorescent molecules available, and they all look pretty much the same. Okay. Each chromosome here has been stained with its own particular combination of fluorescent molecules, but uh, 
all you see is a jumble. It'd be way better if instead of three color vision, you had 50 color vision or 20 color vision. Okay? If you had, each one of your photoreceptors had a very narrow response curve and there were a lot of them, then you could easily tell the difference between pure spectral yellow and a mixture of green and red because pure spectral yellow would excite that one and not the ones flanking it and green plus red would excite the ones flanking it and not in the one in the middle. If you had a creature or a device with those spectral response functions, it could discriminate red plus green away from yellow, and it could also uh, do a good job of figuring out what, uh, uh, dis uh, dis disentangling all those fluorophores. So all right, uh, here's the Sanyak interferometer, whatever it is, it's some, it was designed to you know, guide intercontinental ballistic missiles or something. Uh, it's a way of taking an image and finding the spectrum of every pixel on that image. And if you know what fluorophores you put in, you know, if you labeled one chromosome with Psi 3 and the other with Texas Red and the third one with the Psi 3 plus Texas Red, each one is going to have its own characteristic fingerprint, its own characteristic spectrum. And you can go through that image that's hard to tell apart. Look at some of those bumps are in the infrared where you can't even see. And uh, pixel by pixel, you can say which of those three discrete choices does it most resemble in that pixel and then invent a false color for that and the doctor can see you now. Okay. Now you can tell which of those chromosomes go together. If chromosome number one has been labeled all up and down its length, or number seven, if chromosome number seven has been labeled all up and down its length with Psi 3, whereas chromosome 13 has been labeled everywhere with Texas Red, you could tell them apart that way. And um, let's go back to this one. Uh, th this one's kind of a sad story, okay? Uh, here's some chromosomes that look perfectly fine. They were from the father of a child with a gross congenital abnormality that, that killed the child, and uh, well, under spectral karyotyping, it's obvious that there's been a huge chunk of DNA that's been swapped between two of those chromosomes, completely invisible in the old school karyotyping. So that's good. That's useful. That's worth knowing about. We're entering this era of individual medicine. Okay, so uh, here's something from a particular cancer cell. Every cancer is different from every other cancer. A great deal of genetic recombination has happened in this particular cancer. Uh, if you can look at the fingerprint of that cancer, that's more informative than finding the entire genome. If you just look at the pattern of uh, transpositions, it can characterize it. You know, you pull out your app, and your app says, oh yeah, this patient responded, with this patient with that particular cancer responded to this particular drug better than another drug, uh, then you win. So that's good too. I like this one too. This is, this is my cousin. But don't worry, it's your cousin too. This is a chimpanzee. Okay? People say that chimpanzees, oh, they have 99.9%, 99% the same DNA. Yes, they have 99% the same DNA as us, but look at all those transpositions. Okay? There's a lot of evolutionary history there in uh, how those transpositions happened over evolutionary time. Yes, everything that sticks to some part of my chromosome sticks to some part of his chromosome too, but there have been those transpositions. Uh, these are, oops, sorry. Those are scary, bad transpositions. Uh, these ones are just interesting transpositions from the point of view of biology. Something that you just couldn't see until you invented superhuman color vision. Okay, if that's not enough for you, uh, this is supposed to be that century of the brain, okay, but you slice the brain and it's this horrible tangle. It's all these cells, you know, these long things. Here's just one of them. That's just one cell, look how branched it is, and it's completely packed together tightly with billions of other cells that look equally tangled and messy. Okay, how are you gonna figure out the wiring diagram of something that's got pieces that complicated packed that closely together? Well, if only you could teach each one to express its own unique combination, its own unique and randomly chosen combination of fluorophores, and then you could apply that spectral technique to uh, recolor them in false colors so that now every cell is labeled all up and down its entire length with one distinct color different from its neighbors, now you can see the wiring diagram, okay? Now you can see one in three dimensions, you can have it in three dimensions, okay? You can see uh, the three-dimensional wiring diagram with confocal microscopy, you can see what's connected to what. You want to see that uh, one of these is synapsing onto the other one, well my God, this green one is tangled around that red one, that, that's a synapse, okay? You can get the uh, <coughs> wiring diagram in a new way by a new kind of imaging. Okay, so let me wrap that up. Without an understanding of our own vision, we might not have ever imagined the possibility of doing better than that. 
and certainly not the means to how to do that, but uh, now he can in that spycraft. Okay, and uh, you know, art reminds me of science, everything reminds me of science. So uh, here's a picture from the secret art of Dr. Seuss. It looks a lot like that picture you saw a minute ago of the rainbow, except uh, there's that interesting worm in there. And uh, so just remember where you saw that first, okay? Science hasn't discovered that yet. Okay. Okay, fun. Great, so I had a fun demo, told you a fun story, there were some good applications. Pizza, no, wait. The green bar hasn't gotten all the way yet. So uh, let's, let's think some more. A few small matters remain. Oh yeah, what is light anyway? Haven't really got into that. What is this thing that I call color content? What does it mean? Can we learn something more specific about light and about our eyes? And would there be any other practical benefits? So uh, what exactly is in those photoreceptors anyway that's translating light into electrical impulses heading out to your brain? Well, let's see. We can detect super dim light with a photomultiplier tube. or various pieces of technology that are not biological in character. And either way, that light always arrives, when it gets dim enough, that light always arrives in discrete clicks. It doesn't arrive, it doesn't look like a wave at all. In fact, brighter illumination has the same kind of blips as dimmer illumination, just fewer of them. That's got to be a clue of something. Light seems to be actually lumpy when you get down to small amounts of light. It seems to be coming in these blips. Albert Einstein was forced to that conclusion in 1905. He hated it. Everybody hated it. Something doesn't fit. Oh, that might be an opportunity. Now, you might say, oh, well, no, 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 everything's fine. The light isn't discrete. The light is continuous, like this water. You know, here's something you see at a water park. You know, water comes in continuously, and the hammer goes down, bang, 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 discreetly. Maybe that's what's happening. You know, light is coming in in a continuous wave, and whatever it's, is catching it is just going bang when enough light has arrived on it. But that doesn't quite cut the mustard, okay? That mechanism would give us uniformly spaced clicks if we presented it with uniform illumination, okay? And uh, so just to ram that point home, I prepared a little audio version of that. What you just heard was 300 clicks, uniformly spaced in time. Okay? And it had a kind of musical note to it. It was kind of harsh, but definitely had a pitch to it. Okay? Is that, let me, I, I, I got my grad student to just take some data off that avalanche photodiode and put it through the speaker. Oh, it's horrible, isn't it? But certainly no musical pitch, okay? That's what light sounds like when you send it through the speakers, not that uniform pitch, okay? So this mechanism doesn't seem to be making sense. I find the most uniform source of light that I can, and if it's dim enough, it comes out in that horrible random way. By the way, those clicks are as random as possible. Mathematicians call that a Poisson process. I can simulate a Poisson process on my computer, on my laptop, by you know, drawing random numbers and see what that sounds like. Okay, the simulated data sounds exactly like the real data. Okay, that's not a proof, but still, it doesn't sound, it, it's, those blips of light are coming off at random. Okay, so we gotta deal with that. If you look around the room, you don't see anything random, but then that's because you're seeing billions and billions of photons. If I take a visual scene like this one and expose it very, very briefly so that only a little bit of light comes onto my camera, um, I'm going to see discrete blips arriving. Okay? If I expose it a little longer, I start to see, well, there's some regions where the next blip is more likely to arrive and other regions where the next blip is less likely to arrive. What I think of as a photographic image is a probability distribution function for where is the next blip going to arrive, but the blips of themselves are discrete and point-like things. Just when you get enough of them, you can make good, reliable estimates of how rapidly they're arriving as a function of position on the screen, and that's what we call an image. Okay, so uh, there's another objection to the light is lumpy hypothesis that turns out not to have any force. Uh, even, the so even the slam dunk evidence that light is a wave, right? 
every high school <coughs> physics class, you do two-slit diffraction and say, that's the proof that light is a wave. No, it's not. Here's two-slit diffraction observed by a super-sensitive camera, and it's arriving one point-like blip at a time. What's wavy is the probability distribution function of where the blips are going to arrive. The blips themselves are point-like, and they're arriving at random with some probability distribution. OK, so we're going to have to deal with that if we want to understand light. So here comes a hypothesis. It's a chain of assertions that I haven't proved. Apparently, light comes in these little lumps, which I'm going to call photons. Maybe each lump carries with it a distinguishing quality, which is where it should land in the spectrum. Those lumps are arriving at random. No matter how hard we try to make the light steady, they're still arriving at random. We don't normally notice that randomness because we're seeing such huge numbers of them. But when you crank the light down, you do. That average rate makes sense. That's what I think of as the brightness of the light. And what I've been talking about as the color content of light is the list of those average arrival rates for each place in the spectrum. That's the meaning of light spectrum. It's that mean arrival rate as a function of what kind of photon we're talking about. And what we think of as an image is just some spatial modulation of those average rates. And a color image is modulated in space and also in that spectral position. So that sort of fits things that we already knew with this upsetting new data. But it's still just a hypothesis, right? It's still just a fairy tale until we make it stick. OK, let me, go, let me keep going. There are the things I already said. In the context of vision, apparently, some single molecule in the photoreceptor cell can flip like a toggle when a photon comes by, absorbing it. Or the photon can just fly right by with no effect. And that is a random decision. Sometimes it catches it, sometimes it misses it. The probability to be absorbed depends on what kind of molecule and what kind of photon went by. If the sensitivity curve of that molecule matches where that photon is in the spectrum, then there's a high probability of catching it. And if it doesn't match, then there's a low probability. Okay? I'm continuing with my idea of spinning out some ideas that seem to reconcile the upsetting new data with the old things that we thought we understood. Okay, so I got the meaning of the spectrum of arriving light. I got the meaning of the sensitivity curve. It's a probability for photon capture. The three kinds of photoreceptors are each packed with just one of three kinds of light sensitive molecule. And when I say packed, I mean there's 100 million of them in one photoreceptor cell. Some cellular apparatuses then tasked with the job of counting how many molecules flipped per unit time, and that's what gets reported to the brain. Okay? I haven't proved any of that to you. That's my hypothesis. But at least it's not obviously stupid. So there you go. I've answered all those vexing questions, but it's crazy, right? It starts out with crazy stuff. So uh, what other kind of experiments could confirm or demolish a story like that? OK, so by the way, before we even get going on that, you might say, oh, come on. This has nothing to do with our eyes. Did you ever calculate how much energy one photon has? It's like 10 to the minus blah, 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 joules. It's, it's such a small amount of energy. It can't possibly, it's an inconceivably small amount of energy. can't possibly affect us. Well, here's Calvin. He says, I want to attack, blah, blah, blah. He's got a misconception, right? He doesn't understand about colanders. But uh, he's got something right. He says, I want to keep my ideas grounded in reality. So let's, let's see if we can keep our ideas grounded in reality. Okay. Uh, here's this objection. It sounds devastating, but it's not quantitative. right? Maybe it's not so devastating. Maybe if you work out the numbers, it'll be OK. We'd like a quantitative, falsifiable prediction. But how do you make a quantitative test of a theory that freely admits that every trial will be different at random? Doesn't science demand reproducibility? That's what. Isn't that what they're always saying in Science Magazine? Reproducibility? It's not science if it's not reproducible. How are we going to deal with that? How can we deal with a theory that says right off the bat that something is intrinsically random? Well, OK. Sometimes your theory's prediction is going to be statistical in character. You can falsify or confirm things 
if there's statistical character, if you take enough data. One trial won't do the job, you have to take enough data. As you make more and more trials, you gain greater and greater conviction that your hypothesis is falsified or not yet falsified. Okay, so that's a weird kind of prediction, but it's something that physicists have learned how to do over the past century or so. If our eyes could really respond to individual photon absorption events, sounds crazy, but let's entertain the hypothesis. If we place a photoreceptor cell in total darkness and present it with very dim flashes of light, there must be some unavoidable randomness in its response. I made a little animation here. Uh, each of those little blips is one of those uh, light-sensitive molecules. Here comes a flash of light. Uh, some of the incoming photons hit, and some don't. It's look. When I put that on Facebook, Tom Powers said, you sank my battleship. Yeah. <laughs> here comes another identical flash of light. But uh, what does identical mean? I mean, I left the shutter open for the same length of time. It's not the same number of photons. The photons are being emitted at random, and they're being absorbed at random, too. And so a different set of photoreceptor molecules will uh, absorb them, and not the same number either. And let's try it again. I, this is a computer simulation, OK? I ran the same simulation another time, and uh, a different number came up. So I got a different number of hits every time to nominally identical flashes of light. How can I make predictions about that? Well, I can make predictions about that, but they're statistical predictions. First of all, you need a good experiment, and it took until the uh, 1980s before people learned how to make this experiment. What we got here is a little, oops, what we got here is a little chunk of somebody's retina, some toad, okay? What we got here is a little pipette, and one of those long, skinny photoreceptor cells, that's why they're called rods, one of them has been gently, partially sucked up into that pipette, and here's a flash of light being used to stimulate it. You can imagine that was a difficult experiment at first. Uh, I got this image from King Wai Yao, who was the grad student who did that. And um, so in this little cartoon, there's the pipette, there's an electrode. Uh, there's normally electrical currents circulating outside the cell. Ions are being pushed out of one end of the cell and sucked back in the other end of the cell. There's an exterior extracellular current being interrupted by this pipette. The pipette is in the way. Uh, Ions emerging from here can't get in there unless they go all the long way around through the measuring apparatus. And that's how you measure the res electrical response of one cell to a faint flash of light. So uh, here comes the data. Uh, there are changes in the extracellular current on the order of a picoamp. And down here we have the time, moments in time when flashes of light were presented. And here's the electrical response. And some flashes of light were missed altogether. That's zero hits. Some create a response that's about a picoampere. Some create a response that's about two picoamperes. Those correspond to uh, hitting one or two molecule, uh, photo sensitive molecules, at least. That's the inescapable guess about what this might mean. Uh, I said there was going to be a quantitative prediction. Well, I have a theory that says that every molecule has a certain probability of catching a photon. There's a probability distribution of how many photons arrive, which Poisson distribution. I multiply those together, I get a prediction that there's a Poisson distribution of how many got captured, which depends on how bright the flash was. So I'm going to predict a probability distribution that at dim flashes of light, you'll almost always, you'll, you'll very often get zero, and occasionally get one, and never get two. And then with stronger flashes of light, I'll less often get zero, more often get one, and sometimes get two, etc. So with just one free fit parameter, which is the probability of catching a photon, I can predict that whole curve at any possible illumination intensity. Does that work? Yeah, that works pretty well. So uh, here are flashes of light with one strength, and here's a flash of light that's four times as strong. Here's the Poisson distribution uh, spread out for the uh, instrumental noise. And uh, with just one free fit parameter, I can make this curve work. And then I have zero free fit parameters left over. This one is a complete zero free parameter prediction, and it works out too, and so do the other ones. So this crazy hypothesis that quantum mechanics and individual photon receptions could be relevant to the photoreceptors in our eyes seems to be OK. Uh, the assumption that we can see even a single photoisomerization as the signal coming out of a photoreceptor cell, that was the hypothesis that went into that quantitative prediction and worked out OK. And you know, of course, many other tests have confirmed that as well. So crazy though it sounds, our eyes are these fantastically sensitive 
contain these fantastically sensitive input transducers, which can respond to the absorption of one photon and turn it into an enormously larger uh, energy event, which is uh, the electrical signal they send on down the line. And uh, Dennis Baylor and his colleagues even confirmed that the average number of absorptions varies linearly with the flash strength. That's what was supposed to be uh, shown in that picture. OK. More detailed measurements are possible than that, of course. That was first one is always less detailed. Uh, Horace Barlow and his, and ask, there's an asterisk there. The thing you got to know about Horace Barlow is he's one of the many, many, many great grandchildren of Charles Darwin. And um, you can go see him. I went to see him. He, he's a fellow at Cambridge College. He proposed, and then Barbara Sackett performed a really classic experiment that nobody has ever heard of, so now you're going to hear about it. It's a more advanced version of that. Instead of asking a human subject to say yes or no, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it is not a single cell experiment. It is a whole organism experiment where human subjects were asked to make verbal reports. But instead of yes, no verbal reports, like in the older experiments, uh, Barbara Sackett had her Subjects say, six means, yes, I'm absolutely certain there was a bright flash of light. Zero means, yes, I'm absolutely certain there was nothing. And you know, one means, I'm pretty sure there wasn't anything, but I'm not completely sure. And two means, well, maybe. You know, they, rated, they rated each of the flashes. Every time the bell went off, the subject made a rating from zero to six about how sure are you that you saw a flash of light. And uh, flashes of various strengths were presented. There were some nulls with zero photons. Shutter never opened and 55 to the cornea and 66 to the cornea. And you know, as you present more and more photons, this probability distribution of the various outcomes moves over to the higher values. OK, makes sense. But that's a lot of detailed quantitative data. That's a function of two variables that your theory, you hope, could either explain or fail to explain. OK? So to me, it boggles my mind that nobody ever bothered to replicate that experiment uh, for uh, 40 years. But Heidi Hofer replicated it a little while ago. So there's modern data available on that. And uh, here's Barlow's insanely simple model. He said, OK, I guess maybe there are these, there's this transact, transduction module. Those are those photoreceptor cells. And then there's some relay to some further processing. And uh, we've characterized the photoreceptor cells, because Dennis Baylor knows all about them. We know how often they make false positive signals. We know what fraction of the photons that come in do they catch, and what fraction do they miss. They're completely characterized. They're no longer free fit parameters, because once we fit the single cell data, uh, they're cast in stone. We can't jiggle them. Okay? And the decision module, I'll just say, for every rating, there's some minimum number of photon signals, and if the flash, if the response to the flash exceeds that number, then the human subject is going to emit that rating. Okay? So there's just a couple of free fit parameters, and they're all small integers. So there's very little freedom to goose this model. If it doesn't work, it's doesn't going to work. Uh, the Poisson process thinned by various losses. That's a complete description of the transduction module with the two free fit parameters, which are no longer free fit parameters because we found them. We're going to assume that there's everything is, after that point is totally perfect, no random losses, no false positives. Assume that our neural networks are doing a perfect job after the transduction module, just applying some thresholds after pooling the signals. Okay? Uh, that model was too far ahead of its time, but uh, because Barlow came up with that before the single cell experiments had been done, but uh, now we can do it, and uh, it worked great. Okay, with only a couple of free fit parameters, uh, that entire quantitative data set, and this is like Barbara Sackett's data, but more modern and a little bit uh, higher quality data that Heidi Hofer just came up with a couple of years ago, uh, works really well. Works really well, at, and think about it. Here we are talking about the response of a whole human being. With all of our psychology, that human being is distracted, he's thinking about lunch, he's thinking about all sorts of things, and yet uh, this absurdly simple physical model based on mostly independently measured quantities is working out OK. So OK, now the theory seems rather promising. OK, well, if it's promising, maybe it's good for something. <coughs> maybe we can cook out of it something, uh, some kind of superhuman vision. Once we believe that lumpy nature of light, which we're now entitled to do because it passed a very non-trivial barrier, maybe we can make another step forward. 
Now, what do I mean by superhuman vision? Any microscope, any, any, any pair of binoculars gives you superhuman vision. That's not what I'm talking about. Even the most expensive light microscope can't resolve objects closer than a couple hundred nanometers. Okay? Everything interesting in a cell is smaller than a couple hundred nanometers. All the main, major actors are more like you know, five or 10 nanometers in size. And uh, this so-called optical resolution barrier, diffraction barrier, uh, impeded progress in the field for decades. And it was like holy writ. You just can't, uh, can't do any better than that with visible light. And so you have to give up on visible light microscopy. If you want to see small things, you've got to invent x-ray crystallography or something. But let's think about that a little bit more closely. Here's the spot of light that you get from one single fluorescent molecule viewed through the camera. It's blurred out. It looks like it's a couple hundred nanometers wide, even though it's not. Okay, that's the problem we're talking about. On the other hand, it's a movie, and please watch it closely. This is a molecular motor. It's a, it's a fluorescent molecule attached to a molecular motor. It's walking along a track. Step. Step. You get a step. You get the feeling that it's taking little steps, but the steps are only a few nanometers. They're much smaller than that wavelength, than the, the, the wavelength of light. Uh, doesn't look very promising for figuring out when those steps were and how big they were and other things that you might want to know about this, but let's think about it a little more carefully. Every frame of that video had an array of pixels with a certain number of photons being detected in each one of those pixels in a distribution function that's characteristic of that microscope. And yes, that distribution function is very fat. It's a couple hundred nanometers wide. But still, if you look long enough and you catch enough photons, you can determine where is the center of that to much greater accuracy than its width. It's always going to have the same shape. All you've got to do is take that thing, shift it in x and y until you get the best possible fit. And uh, that's going to tell you where that fluorescent molecule was located to vastly higher precision than uh, its apparent width on the image. Okay? That little insight, we would never have had that insight unless we grasped the fact that light was made out of little lumps. Okay. In that way, uh, my colleague Yale Goldman and Paul Selvin and their buddies found here is a time course of the progress of that molecular motor. It's going nothing, nothing, step, nothing, nothing, step, nothing, nothing, step. You can see these plateaus where the molecule was waiting and these hops where the molecule was taking steps in just one video frame. And now you can see exactly how long each of those pauses were, exactly how long each one of those steps was. And uh, you can learn all sorts of things about uh, the day-to-day -day life of a molecular motor uh, even though you thought you couldn't see anything that small, even though those step sizes are way smaller than the so-called diffraction barrier. So that's a pretty good trick. Okay? They call that fluorescence imaging at one nanometer accuracy because they're such funny guys. They, they, they thought, oh, wouldn't that be great if we named it after a cartoon character? OK, uh, Fiona was uh, just the beginning. You might say, well, is that all? Is there anything new going on? That was a while ago. Well, normally we don't want to see one point of light. We want to see a whole image. We want to see a lot of points of light. And uh, they're all too close to each other. Each one is making a blurred point spread function that's uh, bleeding onto the neighbors. It doesn't seem like you could apply this technique to make a whole image. It's only good for seeing one thing, which is molecular motor stepping. Well, but hold on. Uh, here somebody took a picture of the Eiffel Tower. And this is a video, too. For some reason, people put little blinky lights on the Eiffel Tower, which are all well separated from each other. You can apply that localization technique to each one of those dots of light and turn it into a sharper dot of light by finding its centroid. And then you can pile them up and get this super high resolution image of the Eiffel Tower, which is better than the diffraction limit of the spots that you saw with your naked eye. Let me show you that again. You're going to start. So in the middle, we have the frame-by-frame uh, -frame localization of individual lights on the Eiffel Tower. And on the right, you have the cumulative distribution of all of them piled together. And you see all kinds of extra structure that you didn't see there, which is real and true and correct. So that's the idea of super-resolution microscopy. You apply that to uh, microscopes, and you get named method of the year of 2008. And it can be done. Uh, uh, 
Here's the next level after the original level. Uh, ordinary confocal microscope of some microtubules and some clathrin things. Uh, it's all blurry. With the super resolution technique, you get great resolution. You can even blow that up and still have great res resolution. And you can see that that microtubule is a completely different size from that uh, clathrin pit, uh, something that wasn't obvious to begin with. So uh, we're in this whole new era of seeing what's going on inside cells, inside living cells. Not dead cells, living cells, watching them do about their business. This can be done in video as well, uh, just by realizing that light has this quantum character. So all right, some clues involving our own vision led us to a surprising conclusion about the character of light itself. With that understanding, we would not have been able to understand how to break, break the resolution barrier. Uh, that's spycraft. I should wrap up. How do these stories differ from occult voodoo? Okay. Well, if you leave here unable to think of physicists as mumbo jumbo voodoo priests, then my work is done. Okay. I wanted to show you something about the scientific process. Somebody has a crazy idea, you have to discipline yourself to poke that idea until it emits quantitative falsifiable predictions and then go to the lab and see if you can falsify them or not. And if you fail to falsify them enough times, then they might be a promising hypothesis. That's the process we've been talking about. We started out with a little real reality today, led us to a fruitful paradox. We talked about how to test a theory and why you should do that. It takes effort, it takes money. We learned some lessons that translated into methods that have paid off in unexpected ways. So what did you learn in this talk? Well, strictly speaking, nothing. Okay. You didn't learn anything because uh, you don't learn things until you do them yourself, but you see the tools that people use, and they're not really all that difficult. Okay. Many of the most important calculations are things you can do for yourself using modern tools that were unavailable to the ancients. Okay. I like that. That's one of the things I like about biophysics. Turned out we couldn't understand our own vision at all without some top-level ideas like quantum theory. I like that. I like quantum theory. When properly fleshed out, the discussion makes use of probability theory, biochemistry. You don't need a lot of different kinds of science in there. It's an interdisciplinary subject. I like that. So I've done my best to share with you my conviction that biophysics is a unified whole, best approached without artificial outdated boundaries between disciplines. That's the deep program. That's what I wanted to get across to you today. And let's uh, let Richard Feynman have the last word here. Uh, yeah, 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 but what is quantum mechanics really all about? Well, he says, I've learned to live without knowing. I think my life is fuller because I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> and learn from science that you should doubt the experts. Okay, if I'm an expert, you should doubt me. Okay, I covered a lot of territory. You will enjoy Richard Feynman's little book. You will enjoy David Hubel's free book. You'll enjoy Sean Carroll's book about evolution, which touches a lot on color vision. And I want to say thank you to my hosts and to uh, these entities. And thanks very much. Yeah, Sean. OK, so color, color blindness. Well, everything that makes it harder for you to tell ripe fruit from unripe fruit is bad for your survival. So there's certainly some purifying there to get rid of individuals who have, have defective color vision. OK, uh, why is it men instead of women? Uh, red and green are located on the sex chromosome. And you and I only have one copy where all the women have two. So a woman can get by with one defective copy and use the other copy to get full color vision, whereas you and I, we have one defective copy and we're gone. So that's why it's 4% of males and more like closer to 0% of females. Yeah.
frequency of the light? Or would it not be until you get multiple photons going through and it's actually able to see the frequency? Right. So that. before you can get a color perception, you need to be able to compare the intensities of different wavelengths. So you need enough photons in this category of cells to get a statistically noticeable sample and enough in that before you can say one's higher than the other. Okay. So you're so up. one single photon absorption yeah. will make an event, but uh, your, those thresholds that I mentioned uh, prevent you from being constantly uh, distracted by single photon events. So yeah. Really, you need a bunch before uh, your conscious brain is alerted that there was anything at all. Okay. And when you have that many, then you can start to make discriminations of color. But of course, you know, in dim light, you don't have color vision. Yeah. There is no point when the statistics are poor. So we have a completely different category of photoreceptors that takes over and has only one kind. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh oh, it's the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in those photoreceptors, yeah. uh, when you have a photon, which is energy, yeah. you generate electrical pulse, which is electrical energy. Yeah. What is the amplification of energy? Or it's enormous. Or it's enormous. So uh, how can we have such a high gain, low noise, high sensitivity piece of apparatus that operates at room te at body temperature? Uh, well, evolution has worked really hard on that, okay? There's a cascade of events there. Uh, each one of those photoreceptor cells, each one of those molecules is a small cross-section for catching a photon. So there's a hundred million of them in just one photoreceptor cell to give it a high probability of catching something. And then there are these biochemical reactions that are watching over all hundred million of them to make a report that any one of them photoisomerizes. It's pretty amazing. So there's a several step cascade. Uh, Another thing that I find incredibly inspiring about this is that you might look at that cascade, I didn't show it to you because I didn't want to scare physicists, but it's kind of complicated. <laughs> and uh, you might say, oh wow, why is it so complicated? Exactly the same, almost exactly the same cascade also is being used when we smell, when our bodies detect hormones. You know, a lot of that machinery was just repurposed by evolution. One of those was invented first and all the others were invented as uh, modifications of that. So, uh, that's how evolution works. It doesn't always find the simplest solution. It finds something that works based on something that's already lying around. What has that got to do with your question? Oh, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you were just asking about the gain. There's uh, three steps of amplification. Uh, there's that. I summarized photoreceptive molecule stimulates a machine which starts spinning out something else. And one photon can I summarize one molecule which can cause the chemical modification of a very large number of second messengers. Each of the second messengers controls whether an ion channel is open or not. And when the ion channel is open, lots and lots of ions can pass through it before it closes again. So the two stages of amplification is like in the millions. Okay, uh, there is of course a computational burden of processing more information. So you should stop when you have enough, I think is, you know, who knows, a lot of evolution stories are just those stories. There is that crab with 12 different photoreceptors. So clearly there was some reason why it was at least not military, but that crab is not doing really complicated visual processing the way you and I are. I think there's probably a trade-off and I even have colleagues who think about this in information theoretic terms. You know, how much more information do you get with better color discrimination? And uh, apparently, this is the sweet spot for us, but two is the sweet spot for most mammals. And, you know, creatures that live deep down in the ocean, one is enough for them. And raccoons, raccoon, nocturnal animals, one is plenty. There's no point in having more for them. So, each ecological niche has its different answer to that question. I should point out it's one of the four percent, but there's actually some advantage to not having complete vision in certain you know, in certain patterns. Awesome. Yeah. So they're not as uh, that are visible to me, but not to you, uh, vision people, but an extra. Uh, I love it. We neurotypicals are falling behind in some way. That's great. <laughs> <laughs>
saw some other hands up here. Oh, we've written Um So, um, uh, I didn't really understand the super resolution um, uh, experiment that you mentioned. Is it basically deconvolving with the point spread function of various uh, pixel? I don't think it's deconvolving. <coughs> What you can do in practice is you catch a finite number of photons, and now you do likelihood maximization to say which of the possible shifted versions of the point spread function uh, is, would be most likely to have generated the photons you actually did catch. So you have many different candidates, many different hypotheses for where is that centered, and you calculate the likelihood of each one based on the photons that were actually were present in that video frame, and you choose the winner, and then you move on to the next video frame. So it's not quite what you said, but uh, it's, it's similar in theory. But, uh, so given uh, sufficiently long exposure time, and maybe you can fix problems like microscope objective drifting, yes. is there no limit in resolution that you can achieve with this method? Uh, no. Uh, uh, correct, but remember, you only win like the square root of the number of photons. So uh, if you want 100 times better accuracy, you need 10,000 times more photons. And now you're starting to talk about photo damage and things like that. So in, in practice, and, and bleaching of chlorophores. So in practical terms, uh, there are limits. Because and no, any, most fluorophores, not rare earths, but most fluorophores die after a million photons. And uh, then you're, then you're just no more likely than that one. So, um on the, the plot of the, the sensitivities of the three different photoreceptors, yeah. uh, I'm a little far back, so I couldn't read how the axes were labeled. But what exactly did it mean when the red receptor dipped below zero? Oh, you have such sharp eyes. <laughs> well, I didn't want to get into that, but I'm happy to get into that. OK, so uh, let me just see if I can find that slide, OK? Because I'm so glad you asked that even though I didn't want to get into it. I love it. Yeah, there it is. There are some spectrally pure colors, like this at 500 nanometers, for which no combination of red, green, or blue will make a match. Okay, that human subject twiddles the knobs and twiddles the knobs and twiddles the knobs and can't make anything match, cannot make the neural responses from any combination of red, green, and blue equal uh, the one that they get from 500 nanometer light. Okay? So what the experimenters do, it's very clever. They take the red and they add it to the other side and count it as a negative number. And then you diddle the knobs, and that's where the negative numbers come from. And when you think about this as the result of solving three linear equations, uh, it makes sense. Okay, so yes. Thanks for, having, for pointing that out, that's, that's a good point. Uh, however, that's real experimental data too. It's just that the red had to be added to the other side and counted as a negative number. So that's another success of the theory. It's not just bullshit. <laughs> uh, I think that's a good note. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's thank 